Well, John. What is remote viewing? And then, uh, as I already understand it, and I think many of the listeners here, which we, we do have the benefit of them being open to this sort of thing, are going to want to know how. How can I delve into this after listening to what it is that you've done? So maybe we just go down this whole remote viewing route. You know, how I got into the unit was, and I was, I was an odd cat to bring in there. When I, back at Royal Cape, you had to go through these uh, quarterly, you, you had a, a CI poly, which is called a counterintelligence polygraph. And, it, you know, it's not like the CIA, it's a full lifestyle poly, which is what CIA is good. No, the CI polys are, they're just trying to find out if you are giving classified information away. Have you ever given it away? Or do you know of anybody that is? You know, so it's pretty, pretty simple test. After that, you had to sit down with a command psychologist who was a lieutenant colonel. So this organization and, you know, the total number of people in the organization, that I think that's still classified. But you had to sit with this command psychologist and he had a series of questions that he was going through with you, which was kind of a template. He was checking things off and making notes in your file. Why a psychologist? Because people don't do well coming out of certain kinds of jobs and then coming into a job where you live in a world of secrets, right? You, you live in a skiff, uh, you, uh, you know, secret, secret compartment and information facility. Everything is top secret. All your briefings are top secret. Everything that's being talked about can't be talked about outside the room. It's disruptive to just human well-being. You have to be kind of cut from a certain bolt of cloth to be capable of doing that, which was kind of why the OSS, there's a really amazing book called The Assessment of Men. Difficult to get, but if you can find it. It's a book talking about how to find the kinds of people who can live and thrive in that world and perform the mission, do what they're supposed to do. And not everybody can. You have to sit down with a psychologist and he would ask these questions. He'd go through his little checklist and his last question would be like, okay, well, is there anything else you'd like to share? <laughs> Which I thought was creepy because I was like, well, you know, no. I mean, you're the guy asking the questions. What else would I share with you? Like, you know, uh, but the second time I did that, I told him about something that happened to me as a Ranger Company commander in Jordan. During one of the exercises, a training exercise, which was live fire, very intense and very complicated against a bunker complex, I ended up getting shot in the helmet by a Jordanian machine gun, uh, 2,832 feet per second, something along that line. And it hit me directly in the helmet and got caught by the Kevlar, took me off my feet, but knocked me unconscious as well. And during the time when I was unconscious, I kind of had this weird dream-like vision that seemed to only last for seconds. But when I, when I came to, you know, laying on the desert floor, looking at, you know, my rangers around me and a medic over me, they said I had been like unconscious for 15 20 minutes that I was not coming around. Get medevaced, uh, you know, to a big hospital in Amman, I think. And just they just did whatever imaging they had at the time, which I think was just a x-ray. And I just had a hematoma on my head and didn't have, you know, couldn't wear my steel, my, my Kevlar helmet for a few days till it came down. The dream that I had was of something interacting with me, telling me that I was on the wrong path in my life which when you come to, what the hell does that mean? I mean, right? I mean, I'm not going to jump up off the desert floor and look around at my man and go, you will not believe what just the hell happened to me. A uh, little monk-like creature, yeah, it looks like Obi-Wan, came to me and said, you know, uh, I've chosen the wrong path in life. I mean, choose a new path. And yeah, you know, wouldn't have done that because they would have, you know, the battalion commander would have come over and <laughs> would have picked a ranking lieutenant, given him my company, and they would have put me on the first thing smoking back to, uh, to Savannah. So uh, I didn't say anything to anybody about it, but here I was sitting here with this lieutenant colonel, and I thought, what the hell? So I asked this guy, I said, yeah, you know, in my second time with him, I went, yeah, there is something I'd like to share. I mean, can you explain this? And I shared with him that thing. And I thought from a psychologist perspective, he would give me a clinical explanation for what could have happened, like some 
soft tissue damage or, you know, something else, bruised brain. In those days, they didn't talk about closed head injury or traumatic brain injury. That was not part of the lexicon of the battlefield. So I didn't know what it was. And he didn't even look twice at me. He goes over to a file safe. It's like a filing cabinet, but it's a safe. And he just opens up the drawer and pulls out these blue folders and hands me these blue folders and says, look at these and give me your assessment of them in the morning. So I, you know, brew a pot of coffee and I figure it's going to be a long night. And I was there all night reading these files and going over them and over and again. And in these files, these were actually the remote viewing uh, sessions. Some of them, he kept feeding me more. These are remote viewing sessions done uh, in support of the uh, Iranian hostage rescue attempt in Tehran. It failed at Desert One because they had to turn around and then they had to crash between the, the heavy helicopter and a fuel plane, C-130. And a lot of Americans died in that. But this was the remote viewing work being done in support of that, of that rescue mission. And I, you might ask, why was it being done? It's because, the, and believe it or not, the State Department didn't have the blueprints of that embassy. They didn't have the blueprints of it. They didn't know where the stair were, stairways were. They didn't know where doors were, which, which ones open, how many doors on each floor. They didn't know, you know which places would have been good places to put hostages in. They didn't know any of this. They didn't know which windows were bulletproof. Important thing to note if you're a special operator trying to come in you know, and, and take down that building and rescue the hostages. They knew nothing. They had two sources of intel. They couldn't get any human in sources in there because the Revolutionary Guard wouldn't let, you know, they were very close. The only people, you can only get in there if you were a, an imam or associated with an imam or, you know, part of the Revolutionary Guard. Otherwise, you weren't coming in there or around there, right? So Ted Koppel, believe this or not, Ted Koppel was there with a camera crew. And they were doing interviews with him. And uh, he was interviewing Revolutionary Guard members, letting them talk about, you know, how bad uh, all of the embassy personnel were, that they were all spies working for the CIA. And while they were doing that, the cameraman was just shooting over his shoulder and watching what was going on so they could count the doors and see where the stairways were. And Ted Koppel would be like moving the interview, you know, site around in different places to try to get this stuff. So they were watching that and analyzing that as the only imagery they had of the inside of, you know, the embassy, which is what they needed. And then the other collection methodology being used were the remote viewers. Now, there may have been some others, but those are two I know of. And the remote viewers were doing pretty amazing stuff. I mean, I know that the stadium next to, maybe not far from the embassy, uh, was going to be the, the principal landing zone for the assault force. And it was guarded heavily. They had the large Soviet weapons in, in place, the heavy weapons uh, that were there uh, for anti-aircraft. And they had machine gun nests and other things that were there. And viewers were drawing that sketching doors and sketching locks and the writing on the lock. All of this was in these things that I'm looking at. And then I'll tell you one thing that became the most poignant piece of this for me. Did it answer what I had seen and what had gone on with me? Absolutely not. I'm reading one of these and I can tell it's two different people and they're clearly co-located, but one person is steering the other person to describe things that they're seeing outside of the room where they are. And I remember this very clearly one of the individuals, all both referred to by numbers, not names. One of the individuals says to the other individual, are you outside the doorway where you're supposed to be or the building you're supposed to be? And the other person says, yes, I believe I am. And the other person then tells that person, good, uh, pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room. I mean, holy shit, pass through the wall and describe the contents of the room. Are you kidding me? I'm just an airborne ranger at that point, your ranger company commander, you know, I mean, fresh out of the rangers, a few months out of the rangers. And I'm reading this in a skiff and all of the other stuff that I'm seeing, the locks and the Farsi, the sketches of the Farsi writing on the locks and the doors. And, you know, I'm looking at, all, you know, the correlation of the data between the doors. And I'm not even trained to look for that correlation of data, but I can see it. 
And I'm just amazed. And the next day I'm amazed and he just gives me more and more and more. He's doing a limited read on. I did that for six, maybe eight months before he picked me up and drove me to Fort Meade, Maryland. And when I came into the building at Fort Meade, Maryland, I really didn't know where we were going. He didn't tell me. He just said, I want you to meet some people. And he said, it's relevant to the things I've been asking you to look at. 